ever since around 2018, 2019, whenever Sword and Shield came out, a lot of the Gen 7 metagames have kind of languished in... It's not... Obscurity isn't the right word, but they haven't really had much of a player base or much attention as old generation tiers compared to other generations. You don't really get a ton of really a active forum participation on about Gen 7 OU or Gen 7 UU, but especially Gen 7 Ubers, I feel like, has really fallen by the wayside compared to Ubers tiers from other generations, like Gen 5, Gen 4, Gen Ubers are really, really active, really popular tiers, and uh, Ultrasound and Moon Ubers just has not had that same attention outside of the occasional tournament where it's an obligatory format, but I feel like it's really remiss because this what has kind of always been the tier that I've had the most fun with, I think, um, outside of like a very brief period of time with Balanced Hackmons like five years ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is, I think, it's the tier that really hooked its claws into me early on in competitive, well, Gen 6 Ubers really hooked its claws into me with competitive Pokemon towards the end of Gen 6, and that transferred over to Sun and Moon, and then later Ultra Sun and Moon, and it's the tier that I've come back to the most consistently over the last few years since I've mostly weaned off of playing. Uh, I, uh, I barely play Pokemon now, and I will still, every few months, think, oh, Ubers was, Gen 7 Ubers was really fun, I should dive back into that. And it doesn't stick, because I have other things in my life going on, but it's, uh, it's a really fun and really complex tier, and I just like to take some time to talk about why and what makes it so good. Why it deserves to be given more attention, and maybe more of a resurgent player base, I hope. Um, just a, a little caveat is that I haven't, I've been kind of quote-unquote retired from competitive Pokemon for the last couple of years. Um, I tried to get into Generation 8, but it just never took for me. Um, especially just when they started introducing all the DLCs. And it, just the Gen 7 old gens just have not had the activity to keep my, keep, to, it's just not the same. I'll get to that <laughs> towards the end of this. But, um, the point of all this being that I might get some stuff wrong or have some outdated information. And if that's the case, you're just going to have to bear with me because I, it's, it's been a little bit, but most of the knowledge is still there. So I'm just going to get right into it. Um, before, I guess, really diving into what makes Gen 7 Ubers so good, I feel like it's important to give an overview of Gen 7 Uber, and again, specifically this is talking about Ultra Sun and Moon, um, which sets itself apart with the introduction of Necrozma Duskmane, and to a lesser extent, Ultra Necrozma. Um, Yes, technically, uh, Necrozma Dawnwings is a Pokemon that in the tier, but you're a dummy if you use it. So, this is the tier list you'll find on the Smogon forums is the one from the end of the generation. There has it hasn't had an update in years, so I threw one together, sort of based on my takes on the tier, but again, these are formed through limited play, so I'm willing to accept that I might be wrong about any amount of this. But sort of the key things in this tier is you have these, these four key, the, the tier sort of 
balances itself around the dance between very powerful offensive threats and very powerful defensive counters. Um, you have Pokemon like Geomancy Xerneas, which and uh, Double Dance Primal Groudon, which defined Gen 6 Ubers because of the amount of offensive pressure they could exert. You have things like Ex Sword Stance Extreme Killer Arceus, uh, Combined Primal Kyogre, Mega Gengar, uh, Double Dance Primal Zygarde Complete, Specs Yveltal, uh, Z-Move and Choice Band Marshadow, Mega Salamence. You have, like, an Ultra Necrozma, um, as all these major, major offensive threats that can basically cle cleave through a team that does not pack specific counters to them. Um, if your team does not have a, a Steel type that can take uh, plus two Moonblast from Xerneas, Geomancy Xerneas will destroy you. Um, same for if you don't have something that can stop Double Dance Zygarde or Trick Room ne Weakness Policy Necrozma. So, the, uh, a lot of the tier, therefore, revolves around needing to counter these things through the use of all of these extremely powerful defensive checks. For example, this is sort of, I guess, brings us to explaining the uh, tier list a little bit. The top Pokemon in the metagame, the ones that are the most widely used on teams, or useful on teams, um, and the most just versatile, are these powerful defensive checks in Yveltal, Necrozma, Duskmane, Zygarde, and Arceus with an asterisk. So I've sort of subranked the different Arceus forms, but the general idea of support Arceus being an integral Pokemon in this metagame uh, is kind of enormous. But, um, so you have a lot of, like, Necrozma, for example, being the glue that holds together so many teams, because it is a check to fairy types. It is the thing that stops you from instantly losing to Geomancy Xerneas and uh, Arceus Fairy. It also has the ability, to, because of its stats and its typing that gives it so many resistances, uh, Psychic Steel. It also can come in on things like uh, Mega Salamence's Double Edge, or... Um, like uh, Draco Meteor from Giratina Origin, or um, Oblivion Wing from Yveltal, or also very importantly, plus two extreme speed from E Killer Arceus. So it covers, and then that goes hand in hand with Yveltal, who does a very similar thing with its unique typing that gives it a ground immunity that let it. Um, you check Ultra Necrozma because you are immune to its psychic type stab. Um, you can come in on like Precipice Blades, on, um, thou you, I mean, technically you can't, Thousand Arrows isn't a freebie, but the low, the Yveltal's bulk is a big part of what lets it take some of the weaker attacks in the tier. You get to come in on, uh, Marshadow Spectral Thief. You get to come in on uh, Arceus Ground and Judgment. It's uh, very important stuff like that. So the two of these Pokemon together form basically the de facto defensive core that exists on basically the majority of teams that aren't doing like something really offbeat. Um, but it's also not like they're the same Yveltal and Necrozma. They, there are so many different Yveltal and Necrozma sets. Um, I'll get to this more in detail in a bit, but there's a lot of variety between, like, for Yveltal, if it's Choice Scarf, if it's Taunt, if it's uh, U-Turn, if it's Choice Specs, if it's Life Orb, if it's Bulky Life Orb, if it's Bulky Choice Scarf, if it's Choice Band. Same with uh, Necrozma being, like, is it specially defensive? Is it Trick Room? Is it Rock Polish? Is it Weakness Policy? Is it Solganium Z? Where 
you sort of these Pokemon are picking and choosing what their job, what they are trying to defensively check. Um, Choice Scarf Yveltal is a better answer to something like uh, Marsh Shadow, while Choice Specs Yveltal is a better answer to something like Zygarde, for example. But the inverse is that Choice Specs Marsh Shadow does. Cho I mean, Choice Specs Yveltal is more prone to being over outsped and killed by Marsh Shadow, while Choice Scarf Yveltal can lack the power to break through Zygarde complete. Zygarde then takes, serves sort of the third role, um, and this sort of goes hand in hand with Arceus Ground um, and some Groudon sets of being a defensive answer to Groudon. Primal Groudon is basically the single scariest offensive threat in the tier with a variety of options and being able to switch in on fire moves and ground moves and tank them by having enough natural bulk that you just take them at normal and then being able to either in the case of Arceus ground outspeed primal Groudon with a super effective ground type move or in the case of Zygarde being able to just tank multiple hits because you're that bulky and then threaten back with either a thousand arrows or a status or something else is another key part of not losing. Um, a big thing to keep in mind is that it, it, like, th this it helps shore up the weakness of the Yveltal and the Krosma core, where Yveltal is a good offensive check to Groudon, but Groudon has ways to punish Yveltal coming in. Um, Eruption Groudon, for example, is something that started showing up towards the end of the metagame, um, in part because it punished it was one of your best ways to punish Yveltal trying to switch in on you, uh, on your Precipice Blades. So, <laughs> I'm not going to get super in the weeds and go in depth on anything, on every single individual Pokemon, but that sort of illustrates the sort of key team building archetypes, or fundamentals, I mean, is that you have this very important defensive core in Yveltal, uh, Necrozma, brown type, um, and then, and then you have a ton of flexibility in how you build it outside of that. Um, oftentimes, and then, which brings us to the next most important part is Arceus, and I want to, I'm going to talk more in detail about the value of Arceus specifically in this metagame in a bit, but Arceus plays this specialized role of being able to occupy basically any hole that your team needs filled, um, be it an offensive win condition, a uh, status spreader, a support Pokemon, a check to something very specific. Um, there's a, t like, the thing that lets these sort of in, in, a, in a metagame where you have all of these offensive threats, it is vitally important to be able to build teams that can reliably check everything, and the way that that works, the whole reason that this metagame does not fall apart in itself or become hyper uh, inbred, gameplay-wise, around Primal Groudon and Xerneas, like Gen 6, is that you just have this amazing defensive coverage between, across those four Pokémon, that are is able to just it, it ensures that you have answers and there, but there's also like there's count again i'm gonna get a bit i'm getting ahead of myself a bit so getting to the lower tiers in the metagame are the pokemon that you tend to see more because of their specialized roles in the a tier i have so the s tier is taking up the um these Pokemon that are ubiquitous make their way onto virtually every team, or at least fill a role that is demanded on every single team, and you need a very good reason to not use those Pokemon. Um, the Pokemon in the A tier are the Pokemon that are mostly on every team and that you have to consider in team building, but which you can sometimes forego. Um, Arceus, Varian, and Xerneas sort of illustrate the 
last major role that tends to be important, which is having an answer to Yveltal defensively, to defensive Yveltal sets, which is usually in the form of a fairy type. Um, both of those Pokemon have their weaknesses in regards to exposing you to Necrozma Duskmane and giving up a lot of tempo, and so that, you know, there's some, there's some stuff there, but also your options for fairy types are rather limited. So you tend to see one of, like, Arceus Fairy, or Xerneas, or some kind of, um, sometimes Arceus Dark, or sometimes a Yveltal set that is specifically designed to be Yveltal Mirrors. Um, sometimes a Zygarde set too, although Zygarde is worse at that, because Zygarde, um, Zygarde has risks being overly passive if it's designed to be Yveltal because of the amount of dedicated slots it has, move slots it has to dedicate to, um, I guess I'll <laughs> get to all this later. Um, but the point being that there's a lot of importance in having a defensive check to the offensive Yveltal sets, because despite Yveltal playing a utility role, Specs and Life Orb Yveltal's Dark Pulse it still hits like a truck. Um, so that's your sort of common team building structure, and then past that you have your general roles of like hazards, defog, status, um, try you have these Pokemon in B, C, and D, which play more specialized roles in the metagame. I have the Pokemon in B as being like Pokemon that can do work, but have clearer weaknesses and roles in the metagame, and are harder to just slap on any team. like. Ho-Oh, Primal Kyogre, Mega Gengar, Arceus, Arceus Water, and Mega Salamence all are very potent Pokemon in their own right that can do a ton of work in a given game. Um, they're just not must-haves in every team structure. Um, oh yeah, I didn't talk about Marshadow really quick, is that, uh, I guess it's just one of the premier offensive threats. I, I sometimes come, I have historically, um, gone back and forth on if Marshadow is actually good, but... As a, it, it, in the hands of a good player, it is very threatening. Um, if the Z move hits like a truck and the uh, priority boosted uh, spectral snake, I think the shadow snake, whatever it was called, um, can can have its value. It's just that its typing can also get taken advantage of if there's a lot of fairies running around. Um, An Arceus fairy is often a way to just negate Marshadow's utility in a given game. And so it's 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 sort of on the line, but you do have to pay attention to it in team building. It's basically the other reason you need a fairy type on every single team. Um, but going back to the discussion of the B tier, you have these Pokemon that can do a ton of work, but that you don't necessarily need to um, build your team around. And then in C, I have Pokemon that are similarly powerful, but they their utility is more limited um, by your opponent's team, and you do also have to build your team around them. But they do, like, they still are rewarding enough that they are worth using. Like, Arceus Dark is a Pokemon that I've had middling success with historically, but it does just demolish Yveltal and Necrozma and Zygarde, like, at the cost of being exposed to a number of other things. Giratina Origin also is, like, really, really difficult to play against if your team is not actually exerting, like, doesn't have an offensive Yveltal or an offensive, like, fairy type on it, because, uh, go, like, you just, it threatens Zygarde, it threatens Necrozma, it threatens, uh, Groudon, it's a real pain in the ass. And similarly, Ultra Necrozma, um, has a lot of surprising value more in how it um how it can surprise unsuspecting teams because it's basically a freebie that you get to run on your necrozma dustman um i am admittedly i've been especially defensive necrozma dustman truther for almost the entirety of the tier i do think it is the best necrozma set by far and 
a large part of that is because you win these necrozma mirrors where your opponents have uh ultra necrozma but it could be worse and magirina is basically just a fairy type that has a lot of pivoting i i was all am almost tempted to move magirina down to d because it is it has enough vulnerabilities to zygarde necrozma and groudon that you almost just don't want to run like the opportunity cost which just is too great compared to a different fairy type but it can do work um and then in d tier i have uh therathorn which i know there's people who will disagree with me on this but i just think it's really hard to find space for fairy thorn on a team because of how the gameplay patterns of the tier like i think fairy thorn is sort of begging to get taken advantage of by Groudon, or set up Zygarde, or offensive Yveltal, or Mega Gengar, or Ho Oh, or just so many things. Um, Rayquaza is a niche little thing that a way to answer uh, Primal Groudon that people generally aren't prepared for. Um, Rayquaza doesn't actually have many defensive counters, it's just like not. Similarly, it's not the easiest thing to find room on a team for, but it can do work. And the Arceus Grass is just representative of any other Arceus form. Like, you can put any other Arceus form on a team. Uh, okay, that was... <laughs> I did not mean to go into every single Pokemon in this metagame, but I guess the core... I, I hope that that helps illustrate this core dynamic, where you have this, like, general structure of Yveltal, Necrozma, Ground-type, Fairy-type that shows up on the vast majority of teams and then you have some sort of you have flexibility with both within that and outside of that um not sort of visually represented here there is also it does is worth mentioning um that both stall and hyper offense teams do have a place in the tier i've never been the biggest fan of them i've just i feel like I mean, I don't have a ton of experience with them, I guess, but I've never really found them to be very good when I'm playing against them. But, um, you know, you have your hyper-offense teams that are usually, like, either Greninja-focused or Smeargle-focused or Deoxys Screens-focused that can exploit team structure, like, certain team structures if, like, you know, if you have an expectation of what sets people are running. So I feel like you tend to see... Same with Stall, like you, your Giratina, your Chansey, your Toxpex, these are Pokemon that can do well if you have a better sense of like, I'm trying to build to beat certain things, and I feel like you tend to see these styles more in tournaments where there's a better sense of a concentrated metagame, but at least on the latter, I've just not been super impressed by this. Um, but yeah, the that's a general overview of the Gen 7 Ubers metagame. Um, I hope this has been somewhat coherent before I continue, like, actually let, gives you some, uh, understanding of how it works so that I can actually talk about why it rules. So, I, I, I've already kind of talked about this, um, but the, there is a kind of an insane degree of balance in this metagame that I don't think I've ever seen in, in another game, really. I feel like the only the only thing that comes close is like I don't even know if anybody's gonna get this, but Ravnica Allegiance Standard in Magic the Gathering, like four years ago, where you had a similar situation of um decks that all had tools to beat each other, but the tools were distributed in such a way that no deck could ever really dominate. And similarly here, um, you have this sort of dynamic where you can pick out a bunch of different Pokemon that, any given Pokemon, and identify what does it beat and what gets beaten by it. So, like, just, you know, this is a very simplified chart, obviously, but you can see how, like, the Crosma Duskmane, it beats Xerneas, but gets beaten by Yveltal. Xerneas beats Yveltal, but gets beaten by Necrozma. But 
it gets beaten by Necrozma Dustman, and then so on for Yveltal. And then Zygarde, Xerneas, and Necrozma Dustman also form a little triangle here, where Xerneas beats your Zygarde, and your Zygarde beats your Necrozma, and your Necrozma beats your Xerneas. And same with Primal Groudon, and Yveltal, and the Arceus forms. And, and so, it's not like, this isn't a tier where you, there's some killer Pokemon, like, where you just have to scramble to play, like, weird shit to be able to beat it. This isn't like, I mean, god, I haven't played, maybe someone's gonna come in here and tell me I'm wrong, because I haven't played Gen 6 Ubers in six years, seven years. But um, my memory of Gen 6 Ubers was that beating Extreme Killer Arceus defensively meant that you had to play something, some really specific Pokemon like Mega Sableye or Ferrothorn or Skarmory, um, whose job, or like Arceus Ghost or something like that, um, who's basically was specialized as a way to defensively check um, Extreme Killer Arceus, and it's, you still have that need to put dedicated counters on your team, but those dedicated counters are also Pokemon that are offensively good in their own right. Like, it's not like, oh, I'm putting Mega Sableye on my team for, just for your, uh, your Arceus, and Mega Sableye is dead weight in every other game. It's like, I'm putting my Necrozma on here for your Xerneas, but Necrozma also serves valuable roles against your support Arceuses and your, uh, your Mega, your Primal Kyogre and your Mega Salamence and it, just like various other Pokemon that it can play a role versus. Um, which I think is important for avoiding the issue that a lot of these high-power metagames tend to have, which is that they can often degenerate into very offensive, like, haymaker versus haymaker strategies, where um, you just... you are just seeing who can do the offensive thing more, you are either... You're just trying to <laughs> get as much damage out as possible and knock out your Pokemon opponent's Pokemon as quickly as possible. And especially what tends to happen with that is um, it turns into a lot of metagame fishing where you have your offensive team. I mean, this is what happened with um, Gen 7 OU, where there were so many offensive threats, but not enough generically good defensive answers that could also do work in their own right that you would either have to play a team that had a percentage chance of just getting washed by something you couldn't counter, or you would have to build your team around beating that thing and then expose yourself to getting beaten by something else you, couldn't, you didn't have room to cover. And that's just not... Like, that... Uh, theoretically, if you're build a team in a certain way that you can end up in that situation where you're like in this tier where you're like oh i don't have a check for choice band ho oh but realistically like this these top four pokemon especially are so good at adapting to whatever your needs are and countering stuff while also being ex that uh your it creates functional team building without hitting the metagame fishing problem. But also, the other problem that could happen with that is that you could, when you get into those situations where the defensive cores are so good, usually what happens is that the metagame degenerates into these defensive mirrors because offensive teams struggle to break through those defensive cores because you have the perfect answer to everything. And that doesn't happen either because the perfect answer, like the offensive threats fit on the same teams as the defensive stuff. So it's not like you're doing the Yveltal, Necrozma, Zygarde, Arceus thing all uh, on a separate team from your Xerneas Groudon team. Like, those are the same team. Like, 
uh, I mean, I'm going to talk a bit more detailed about team building of the sample team in a little bit, but the, it's, um, you're given, like, your basic team structures because of the choice of Pokemon that you have access to makes it so that you both have the ability to defensively answer the offensive, the hugely offensive threats in the metagame, while also being able to offensively pressure your opponent's counters to your same thing. Which is, I mean, if you've played any amount of competitive Pokemon, you know that that's not unique to this metagame, and that's like a thing that happens a lot of the time, but I think that Gen 7 Ubers is unique in that every Pokemon just sort of perfectly fits into this matrix. There's no, there's no outliers where it's like, oh yeah, well this is clearly like busted. I, I think the only thing you could really call close to busted is like Psyguard maybe, and but that's just more because it's annoying and because it has glare and substitute. Um, but yeah, speaking a bit more in detail about Yveltal, Necrozma, and Arceus and their role. Um, these are just a handful of Yveltal sets, just to illustrate the variability that Yveltal has. And this is really great for the metagame because it allows for a lot of adapt adaptability while also creating a lot of stability within the metagame. Um, for, for example, so I, I mentioned Eruption Groudon earlier, where eru later on in the generation, uh, Eruption Groudon started taking up in usage as a way to heavily punish Psyguard and Yveltal and uh, basically anything that didn't resist fire and or didn't have tremendous special defense as a uh, as an answer to it. And one of the sort of issues that Eruption Groudon presented was that uh, it just did, like, it just carved through the established, like, Yveltal, Necrozma, Zygarde uh, fairy-type cores, because they didn't really have a safe switch-in. But, I mean, like, what ended up happening was that the Arceus core, like, these cores were able to just shift around a little bit. You could say, oh, well... I'm going to start playing specially defensive Groudon, or specially defensive Zygarde, or Arceus Water, or even like um, Spideff Arceus. I mean, it's like a Spideff Arceus Ground isn't like the best thing, but these Pokemon that had. that still fit on these normal team structures were able to basically adapt in such a way that it's not like it pushed Eruption Groudon out of the meta. Eruption Groudon is still very good. You can still win a lot of games with Eruption Groudon, and if teams aren't ready for it, uh, you just wash them. But it, it it prevented the scenario where your team would now be have to be reinvented from the ground up. Which, I understand that there is an appeal to that, to having a totally evolving metagame where there's just new stuff every, like, month. But realistically, like, there's... I can jump on the Uber's ladder with a team that I made three years ago and mostly still be fine or may only have to make minor adjustments because the metagame is stable. The metagame is, like, these are a lot of known quantities and the things that stay at the top have the ability to adjust to whatever it is. So, and what that means also is that when you know that Yveltal and Necrozma and Zygarde and Fairy types are perpetually the best thing to be doing and that show up on every team, that means that you can consistently build your team to take advantage of that. You know that, like, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time something, some new thing gets, comes out. You only have to adjust, which, I mean, again, I, I know that there is fun in reinventing the wheel um, and having to start from scratch and having that period of discovery. But I also think it's really, I mean, as someone who stopped playing competitive Pokemon in large part because the combination of, like, massive power creep leading to perpetual suspect tests and also DLC, uh, 
pushed me out of Pokemon because it led to an, a brand new metagame coming out every month. Uh, for Gen 8, it's like, I... I think there's a ton of value in just having this kind of stability, where you know Yveltal is pretty much always going to be one of the best things to do, because nothing's going to overtake Yveltal. But also, there's a lot of value in the fact that these aren't really huge offensive threats, but that they play defensive reactive roles. I mean, it, it, it's... The key offensive threats are something that is always having to react to whatever... Yveltal and Necrozma and Zygarde and Arceus are doing, rather than the other way around. I mean, you can look at metagames where, um, like if Groudon had been the best thing, and now you need to say, oh, well, uh, I need to build more defensive answers and have more ways to check Groudon, and then Groudon comes out with a new set, and you're like, oh god, I need to pick a different Pokemon that can beat this Groudon set, build a different set. I think there's some fun in that, but, um, there, I think. Shoot, I forgot the point I was gonna make. Hang on, it'll come back to me. Um, I don't know. I think that there's a lot of value in having the top thing be this sort of reactive thing that can adjust to the meta game, while uh, always having these weaknesses exposed. That if Yveltal adjusts in a certain way to beat a certain Groudon set, it often exposes a new weakness to maybe a Primal Kyogre, and that gives room for these new offensive threats to come in. And, I mean, again, this is not like a n totally unique thing to Gen 7 Ubers, but I do think it is just a valuable thing for metagames to consider that um, there's sort of a natural evolution of the metagame that comes from the having these kinds of things on top um at without being too unstable so i want to go a little more in depth on team building um i did get ahead of myself a little bit but this is a sample team that i made like two or three years ago like 2019 i want to say um that i think sort of illustrates um I, I guess, like, it illustrates both the principles of team building and also why this team tier is so good for team building. Um, you, there is a, I mean, the joke that I used to make was that every every Gen 7 Ubers team came pre-built with uh, five Pokemon, where you would always have Necrozma, you would always have Yveltal, you would always have either, either Groudon or Zygarde, you would always have either Xerneas or Arceus Fairy, and then you would have a couple flex slots for whatever your sets demanded. And that's not like entire. It's, I mean, it was always a joke. It was kind of tongue in cheek, but there is some truth to the fact that you can look at the top threats in the meta game, and like you can look at your crowd on, you can look at Geomancy Xerneas, and you can, as a new player, and you can easily identify like how do I not lose to Xerneas? Oh, specially defensive Necrozma. How do I not lose to Groudon? Oh, physically defensive Zygarde. And that, like, that creates a very just clean, easy way to get into the metagame. And this is sort of contrasted to um, other tiers where you have a ton of stuff to consider. You have, that isn't really clear how to beat it. Um, where you're having to think about, like, how do I beat, I mean, I guess, uh, like, what, like, current gen OU, if you're thinking, how do I beat Slowbro, how do I beat Clefable, how do I beat Toxapex, how do I beat Tabu Coco, how do I beat Garchomp, um, when there's, there's not as clear of answers, I mean, uh, there is some fun, admittedly some fun lost in um, getting to do something like super niche, like having the team building be kind of on, having these guidelines can feel at times like it's um, 
stifles creativity, although I don't necessarily think that's true. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, it's a really good on-ramp for new players to be able to just look at what the top threats are and what the top, what's just what the top Pokemon are and easily identify this, these are the things I should be running. It um, really shortens the phase of getting into a tier where you're just thinking about like trying to figure out what's good because I think it's not hard to just like lose to Xerneas once and think, oh, I should have something that resists Moonblast and has a lot of bulk. Hey, Necrozma's good for that. But even then, I don't, like, I use this team as an example because Ars this Arceus Grass set that I had a lot of success with was also something that I just came up with whole cloth because this team needed an answer to Primal Kyogre. Like, Arceus Grass is not a Pokemon that gets played in Ubers. Even this Xerneas set, uh, that it's a support Xerneas, is not very common in Ubers, but uh, this team composition sort of allowed for specially defensive Arceus Grass as a counter to Kyogre and Zygarde uh, to be a thing that could also just like do some chip damage to Necrozma with Fire Blast, and then having access to Xerneas as a defogger uh, when people expected Geomancy most of the time was also pretty good. So even though I think at the outset you can see, like, oh, you use a lot of the same Pokemon, oh, there's not a ton of room for variety, uh, that, that, that isn't entirely true. There is, there is a lot of room to get creative, especially when it comes to Arceus, um, who I think deserves special attention for having 18 different forms and a, knows, like, almost every move in the game. Like, one of the things that tended to happen, especially in tournaments, was that having a niche Arce Arceus type would often be just a way to counter specific, very specific team combinations as, like, a setup sweeper. That there are just some teams that literally can't beat Arceus Poison, or Arceus Electric, or Arceus Flying. And, I mean, on the latter, it's never, like, the best thing in the world, but when you have a specific idea of what you're trying to target... Um, being able to use Arceus to just say, like, I am going to have my Arceus as Arceus Poison, and you're not going to be able to beat me, because your team does not have a way to beat a Poison type. Or your team does not have a way to reliably hit a bulky Flying type for any amount of damage. So, and they're... they're there, that that also extends to, like, Necrozma and Yveltal and Xerneas and Groudon as Pokemon that just, like, there are a million Groudon sets, there are a million Yveltal sets, there are a million Necrozma sets, and they don't all play the same. It's not like you're building different, so it's like swapping out one move for another, like one coverage move. It's like, weakness policy Trick Room Necrozma plays wildly differently from, like, Toxic Spadef Necrozma. Eruption Groudon plays very differently from Stealth Rock's Groudon. Uh, Geomancy Xerneas plays super, just, just a different Pokemon from this Defog Xerneas. So, that, that sort of thing is, um, there's a deceptive amount of depth that goes into team building, um, that especially really rewards, um, players who are engaged with the metagame and who have played for a while and know what's going on. We'll get to that little bit because that's one of my favorite parts so the next thing that really makes this stand out is that the gameplay is just fun like i mean this is a lot more um subjective to what i personally like um but games of ubers tend to revolve around the the threat that any given Pokemon can do a ton of damage to anything that isn't its specific counter. I mean, I've, I have this screenshot here, for example, where my uh, my Giratina is doing a big chunk of damage out of their Kyogre. Their Kyogre is doing a big chunk of damage to my Giratina. And 
Uh, like, you basically, like, um, sorry, brain just went again. Hang on, it'll come back. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of, um, playing around the threat of a lot of damage. Any given turn, you have to consider the fact that you're facing down Pokemon with, like, base 180 attack, 120 power stab moves, uh, that can and will completely destroy you. Um, no matter what. Like, so you have to, the way that you don't lose these games is by considering, like, Sort of the level one is that you switch into your counter. In this situation here, the Kyogre, uh, I, if I switched into Arceus Grass, I'd be fine. You take like 35% for that Ice Beam. I'd switch into my Arceus Grass, I'd tank the move, and then they'd be staring down Grass Knot, and they'd have to switch into it. They'd switch into their Yveltal, then I'd go switch into my Yveltal, or my Zygarde, or something, my Ho-Oh, or something, and then they would do something. And then I would do something. Um, but the thing that dictates the flow of the game at first glance is your need to absorb hits. Now, where it gets fun is once you know this, and once your opponent knows this, you have to take advantage of... You can take advantage of the fact that you're threatening massive chunks of damage. So. For ex in the aforementioned example, they have their Kyogre, I have my Giratina in, and I have my Arceus Grass. I could switch to my Arceus Grass, absorb the Ice Beam, and then knowing that they have the Yveltal coming in, I could pivot to my Zygarde, which is, and then get off a Glare on whatever their Pokemon is. Now I've gained a meaningful advantage in this exchange because I've paralyzed something. They probably switch back into their Kyogre, and now they have a paralyzed Kyogre. So that when I switch back into my Arceus Grass, uh, then they go back to their Yveltal, then I go to my Yveltal, and I fire something off. Or I go to my Ho-Oh, and I hit him with a Sacred Fire and try to burn something. Or a Brave Bird. Or I go to my, uh, I go to something. Honestly, this isn't a great matchup for this team. <laughs> um, but... There's a lot of consideration that has to be, that comes in, the point, the point of all this is that a lot of the fun of the game comes when both players are aware of the fact that you are, that every turn you are forcing your opponents to do something to avoid taking a ton of damage, and that you are gaining advantages, prim you are therefore gaining advantages primarily using that information, that either you are using the threat of damage to set up a hazard, or set up status, or get a pivot, or just get an unexpected move off, or do a double switch, and I can already hear you saying, you're thinking, oh, Joan, this is how all Pokemon works. You threaten, uh, <laughs> you threaten your stab move, and they have to switch out of it, but it's like, that dynamic is intensified in Ubers. You contrast this to, like, tiers like OU, where Maybe your uh, Thunderbolt from Tapu Koko on a neutral target is doing, like, maybe 40%, and it's just damage that can be absorbed, and you can just heal it off later. Um, the massive damage increments in Ubers just speed up the game. You do not have often the opportunity to just use recovery moves freely. You don't have the opportunity to get up hazards freely. You don't have the opportunity to... Uh, really absorb damage willy-nilly. Like, um, part of why I chose the screenshot is because it does show a situation where uh, large damage numbers are being absorbed um, to my advantage. Um, but, like, the gameplay is dictated by the fact that basically on every single turn, you have to make this calculation of taking a huge chunk of damage or and figuring out how to turn that to your advantage. Either by negating the damage or positioning or what. So, in, in this game, I believe the, uh, using this as an example, um, turn one, I trade damage 
to put the Kyogre in range of getting one hit KO'd by Yveltal, such that now, if at some later point my Yveltal come, is able to double switch into their Kyogre, their Kyogre can no longer stay in on my Yveltal without dying, which, force, which will later on in that game force my opponent into a position of having to either sacrifice their Kyogre or bring in something else, which could be something like their own Yveltal or potentially an Arceus Fairy if that's what they have in the back. Um, that is what they had in the back, although I don't remember. Again, this game, this game was four years ago. Um, but yeah, so that's what dictates the game. Um, I do, one of the things that I think is, can be appreciated is that this just speeds up games. This makes them faster. Games of Gen 7 Ubers rarely go past like 20, 25 turns. Um, unless you're specifically playing against Stall, or unless you end up in, like, these support Arceus status mirrors, or these Zygarde mirrors, um, which are kind of hellish, but that's Pokemon. <laughs> um, but yeah, most of the time, um, I personally just appreciate fast games of any game, because I don't like to, um, I know this is the thing that people disagree with me on, if this isn't your preference, but I do strongly prefer to have games that are over within, like, five to ten minutes, as opposed to some of the games of other tiers I've played, where you have your grind fest that goes on for half an hour. That just never happens in Ubers, unless you're in a stall mirror. Even the stall teams just win or lose quickly. Ah, getting some water. So, as a result, that's very fun. And I mean, the, again, it's all subjective, but um, I, I do think there's a lot of fun to be had in the way that this tier um, is dictated by these high damage numbers. Um, so, continuing and uh, talking a little bit more in depth about this, um, the metagame really because of how because of how rewarding um getting off a successful attack is because any given attack is taking off like 40 to 80 percent of your opponent's health depending on the matchup like you are really rewarded for knowing what's going on the tier rewards experienced players it rewards like good skill and not just clicking buttons it rewards long-term planning being able to, and it rewards innovative um, set building. Part of the value of Arceus Grass was that nobody expected Arceus Grass, so nobody knew what my Arceus Grass was running. People would um, just like spam uh, Origin Pulse with their Kyogre and give me a free switch in into Arceus Grass, which I'd take 20% off, and then they would try to fire off an Ice Beam, not thinking that it would do, like, 70%, and watch it do 30, and then get KO'd by Grass Knot. It, it's... They would bring in their Zygards and not consider the fact that I had Ice Beam on my Arceus Grass. Um, even uh, something like Primal Groudon could often... Uh, I mean, the fire moves would knock out Arceus Grass, but... Arceus Grass would also guaranteed outspeed and at least do a big chunk of damage with Grass Knot, because it's neutral damage. Um, and so, yeah, obviously if Arceus Grass was more common, it wouldn't be as effective because people wouldn't know how to play around it. But that surprise factor goes for a lot in this format because you are so rewarded for any amount of damage that you do. Any successful attack is just... It's big. Um, and a lot of that does tend to manifest itself in the value of bluffing in this and set reading based on team composition. Um, I mean, this is <laughs> this is part of why I think the tier isn't actually like playable in the same way now is because the tier was at its most fun when both players were experienced Ubers players who... Where, when who knew enough to both bluff each other and play around each other's bluffs, when you could think about 
the fact that your opponent had the same amount of information as you. Like, the, um, the fact that Arceus doesn't reveal its type until it shows up on the field for the first time was a huge part of this, because you would have to play, you would have to basically try and figure out what your opponent's Arceus was, and preserve your checks to that Pokemon, because if you, if your uh, Necrozma Duskman died, and they had an Arceus Fairy, you would no longer have a way to beat Arceus Fairy. You just wouldn't. Like, you would not be able to reliably brute force it, unless... I mean, yes, theoretically there's other Pokemon that could beat Arceus Fairy, but for the most part, um, you would need to play in a way that is both... You you would need to... So while the the high reward of high damage numbers and tempo and smart positioning, risky plays, all encourage like the, a very offensive play style where you are the person who is trying to aggressively predict what your opponent's doing and put them in bad situations, you also, at the same time, needed to play conservatively enough that you wouldn't be dead in the water against something like a surprise Arceus. And this is also like going for surprise like Groudon sets, surprise Zornius sets, surprise Necrozma sets, surprise your Veltal sets. Um, sort of just based on how games played out, you tended to know what your opponent's um, Yveltal or Groudon was on pretty early on, because those are the most common leads. But um, I've lost games to being surprised that a Groudon was double dance instead of just uh, three attack Stealth Rock. That's, that's happened. <laughs> um, I've lost games to misreading and thinking that a Yveltal was Scarf when it actually turned out to be Specs and just taking way more damage than expected. Um, maybe that's a bad example because that doesn't happen, but like misreading a Yveltal and making a switch that didn't work out. Um, and I've definitely lost games to misreading an Arceus and then not having a way to break it. So. Um, I, I really think that this is where the skill component of the metagame comes in, is that you just, if you knew what was going on, if you knew, like, what the common sets were, what the common team compositions were, what your opponents were likely to have, you could look at their team, play, like, play, like, the first four turns, and generally have a sense of how you needed to play and how the game was going to go. I mean, really, at, at the peak, you would play out the first three turns and then figure out what the pattern of like the next 10 turns was going to be and then figure out what exactly you needed to do to put your opponent in a negative position. I mean, going back to what I was talking about before with the uh, this example here, um, if you know that how things are going to go is Kyogre is going to Ice Beam into Giratina, so, and then Giratina is going to Draco Meteor, they're going to switch out their Kyogre into Yveltal, and then I'm going to go into my Ho-Oh, then they're going to go back into Kyogre. The way that you would disrupt that, if you know that like these are the things that are most likely to happen based on how my opponent is playing this game, uh, you are able to disrupt that by saying, like, on the turn that you go into Yveltal, I'm going to go into my Ho-Oh, so that I get the tempo and that my Ho-Oh is able to uh, like, land a Toxic on something. Because you can't switch your Necrozma Dusk into it. You have to bring in your Kyogre, and then it gets a Toxic or Kyogre. And, I mean, that's not even, like, a very extreme example of, like, a lot of what made Eruption Groudon so good was because it um, utilized this extremely well. If you could double in an Eruption Groudon at a well-timed moment, your opponent could sometimes just lose on the spot because they would not have a safe switch into eruption. Um, so. I mean, it, that stuff is fun, but it's also very skill rewarding. Um, you can definitely, I mean, I can see how some people might think it's bullshit to just like get the wrong double and lose the game on the spot, but it's also, it's extreme. It's, I think it's the tier that I feel like has been the less, the least vulnerable to um rng and the most like rewarding of skill play that i've ever played 
Um, Hastert and Sadas also played a really interesting role that was actually really interesting um, because of the aforementioned thing with Tempo. You did not have free opportunities to set up hazards and status like you do in lower tiers just because you would often be doing so at the cost of a ton of damage. Groudon ended up being one of the best stealth rockers in the tier. Well, Groudon and Necrozma were the two of the best stealth rockers in the tier because they would often force out whatever they came in on and would get sort of free tempo in that sense. But outside of, like, even in that case, there were a lot of times where you didn't, you couldn't really go for stealth rock because you just needed to get damage on whatever they switched into. If they had, if you're the eruption Groudon and they have the, the Zygarde, you just gotta click that eruption. You, you don't have time to stealth rock because you can't let a free Zygarde come in. Um, and so I, I always appreciated that. I mean, I know hazards are controversial in Pokemon. I've always been a fan of them because of the way that they stop. They bring games to a close. I think that, especially in this metagame, hazards are another important balancing element for keeping Yveltal in check, and to a lesser extent, Arceus and Crowdon and Necrozma, by just not letting them switch in for free infinitely. Um, like, with Groudon in particular, the fact that its damage is unrecoverable and that um, it's not that fast means that if Groudon came in too many times, it would suddenly just be dead versus Yveltal. And with Necrozma, uh, even as a stealth rock resistant Pokemon, if it came in too many times, you would eventually be forced to uh, spend a turn healing, and that is very exploitable. And with Yveltal, I mean, it, the 25% is just... <laughs> Oftentimes, like, forcing a Yveltal to click Oblivion Ring instead of Dark Pulse is another very exploitable moment. So, I think that Stealth Rock is just a very important part of this metagame, but there's a real, there's really interesting considerations that come from the fact that you just don't get Stealth Rock up for free. Um, and then Status um, was is huge in Ubers, but has the same issue of it's not free. You most commonly would see like Toxic on Arceus and Glare on Zygarde as ways to sort of... I mean, Glare, I think, is one of the reasons that Zygarde is arguably the best Pokemon in the tier. <laughs> Just because it was a... It is a generic way to punish just like anything that comes in like the only pokemon that really didn't doesn't care about glare is like ferrothorn but every single other thing is just completely fucked over by it um i mean i guess like opposing zygarde sometimes don't care about it depending on the zygarde set um but like it punishes Yveltal's, it punishes Xerneas's, it punishes um, Kyogre's. It just makes so many matchups worse. And Toxic ends up being a very important way to stop, um, to a lesser extent, Yveltal, but mainly Arceus and Zygarde from really dominating the uh, pace of play. The fact that, like, it puts this timer on Arceus, especially towards the late game. What you would tend to see a lot is an Arceus that is poisoned and is being forced to come in more and more because maybe you only have like three Pokemon left and it's just taking this chip damage and eventually is forced to either recover and that becomes exploitable and the Arceus drops. Um, Combined Arceuses were, uh, would basically be in this really interesting spot where um, building a building a Calm Mind Arceus was a really interesting thing to do, where you had to either play... You could do a set of Judgment, Calm Mind, Refresh, Recover, but that would limit your sweeping ability, because you would, oft, you would have to eliminate more Pokémon, and oftentimes at that point, Calm Mind was kind of super, superfluous. You could eliminate Recover and just have Refresh, so that you don't have to worry about Toxic, but then you get worn down over the course of the game. Or you could get rid of Refresh, but then you can't Calm Mind people once you are Toxic or Paralyzed. 
and you can't get rid of Calm Mind, although I have I have had a couple teams where I eventually turn a Calm Mind Arceus into a just a support Arceus with offensive stats because uh, because of this. But or you could go for two attacks like Refresh Recover and have Aromatherapy on something else like Magirna or Xerneas, but then that makes it so that that puts this big tempo cost on you. So it, it was a really interesting feature for keeping Arceus in check, both like implicitly with the Calm Mind variants that would otherwise actually be a pretty big deal in this metagame, and with the um, a support variants, which would oftentimes, usually the way that support Arceuses go down is either they get sapped to bring in something else, or they uh, die to Toxic. So, again, very important. And of course, like, Sticky Web shows up every now and then on uh, Hyper Offense teams, and same with screens. So, last part of this is metagame development. So, I've mostly gone over all these points, but the I, I sort of want to reiterate that the metagame was able to both constantly evolve while staying stable, which is something that is very hard to accomplish in any given game. Like, you can... Usually, how these things tend to go is that one thing will be the best thing, and then a bunch of things will no longer be viable anymore, because the new thing just pushes them out of the metagame entirely, and now people have to, like, reinvent shit to, uh, to even consider playing. Um, god, the Discord notification really distracted me. Um, <laughs> uh, like... <sighs> Like I've said before, you could take my Arceus Grass team from three years ago and still do well on the ladder with it. You could take, like, you could build a team and the things you have to care about are still mostly the same as they have been, but that does not preclude the ability to then find exploits for whatever the top things are. Once you identify what the big Groudon set, what the big Xerneas set, what the big Yveltal sets are, you can say, okay. I'm going to build with such and such Pokemon or such and such set to uh, to get that, to fuck it over, to exploit the metagame. Um, so, I just want to touch one more time on Hyper Offense and Stall as teams that I don't really, I really don't have enough experience to talk about, but they do, they are these things that exist, like, when that I think continue to illustrate that point of, like, once the metagame sort of stabilizes and you have a sense of what the top sets in Pokemon are, that there exist these, like, alternative exploits. I mean, I think if you're going to put a knock on this metagame, it's that a lot of the teams look have mostly the same Pokemon, even though they're different sets, and it, it's... Oh, there's... It's hard to justify a lot of the stuff outside of that. Like, I tried so hard to make Palkia work in this tier, and it just sucked, even with Z-moves. Same with Kyurem White. Like, the the value of a replacement just isn't, doesn't make it worth it. But I, still, at the end of the day, like, there are these alternative ways to approach the tier in the form of stall and hyper offense that while not as maybe consistent as the other stuff, they still reward skill, and you can still win games with them. Um, I have lost a lot of games to Giratina specifically because it's just it's just a wall. And I've also lost a lot of games with Giratina because I'm um, outside of like three weeks in 2018, I'm not a stall player. Um... So that brings us to the end of this video. Um, I hope that this has at least drawn some interest in a reappraisal of Gen 7 Ubers. I think it is, again, pretty much the most fun and the most engaged I've been in any metagame of anything ever. I mean, that includes when I was playing like 10 games of standard a, a day 
for Magic the Gathering, that includes, like, back in 2016 when I was drafting Shadows over Innistrad uh, religiously. Um, like, this has really been... This is this is my baby. This is, I think... But it, it sucks because, like I've said, the... The la like it the latter is takes a a long ass time to find a game, and it's uh the quality of the game just isn't that great most of the time because the fun of the tier came from the mind games and the bluffing and the skill. So um I think it's time to bring it back, you guys. I think we should all go on the the Pokemon Showdown, Ultra Sun and Moon, Uber's Ladder and spend a million hours grinding it up and learning the tier, and the look on Joan's face will be so ecstatic. And thank you for watching my video. Um, this is all unscripted, so... I mean, probably as you can tell, so... Um, <laughs> I have no idea how coherent or engaging any of this was, and um, I have no intentions to ever do anything like this again, especially because I do not have remotely as much to say about... Um, any other aspect of competitive Pokemon, except for maybe if I was gonna um, bitch about how mismanaged Gen 7, you know, if anybody wants to hear me bitch about how badly mismanaged Gen 7 OU was, um, prompt me a line, because I'll absolutely do it if there's interest in it, because god, someone needs to know. But, point is, you should try playing Gen 7 Ubers. It's pretty fucking fun. It's pretty good. Uh, it's really rewarding. This video is making me want to hop on the ladder again, even though I know it won't be the same as it was back when it was the current gen. But, you know, that's life. Things change. You gotta, you gotta pass it on. I'm gonna end this video now. Thank you all for listening. I think this is gonna be, like, two hours long, but, you know, hearts, peace and love.